Well, today we're going to uh, start in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And uh, the title of the message is, When a Little Man Stood Tall. And a subtitle, Principles of Prayer. So listen as I read the first five verses of Nehemiah 2. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, and that's going to be about 445 B.C., and I want to give you a little prophetic note attached to this. If you go home after the service today and read Daniel chapter 9 and verse 25, those verses in that section find, are, are speaking about what happens in this, in this book. So, and, and that's looking forward prophetically to when the Messiah would come, and then it looks deeper and farther out to when Messiah returns. So we're in the year about 445 when King Artaxerxes is ruling. And uh, Nehemiah says, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. He was a cupbearer. And the job of the cupbearer was to sip the wine to see if it was poison so he would die instead of the king. So he says, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? You know, the king's wondering, is there something wrong with the wine today, okay? He said, this can't mean anything but sadness of heart. And Nehemiah says, I was very much afraid. He was afraid because he thought there might be, the king might think there was a conspiracy and would kill him. So he says, I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. And he's referring back to Jerusalem. The king said to me, what is it that you want? And Nehemiah says, I prayed to the God of heaven and then I answered the king. If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Now the title of the message is when a small man stood tall. And quite honestly, I don't know how big Nehemiah was. But I do know he was named Nehemiah, and so I know that's a bad pun. But, but you know, if I'd have just titled this message, Principles on Prayer, you'd have thought, oh, it's just going to be another prayer sermon. But when I titled it, When the Small Man Stood Tall, maybe that got your curiosity. So, so I'm not sure how tall Nehemiah was, but he did stand tall before the Persian king, and that's because the power of prayer. And that's how we all stand tall is through the power of prayer. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, a very gifted preacher of days gone by, said prayer is beyond any question the highest activity of the human soul. Man is at his greatest and highest when upon his knees he comes face to face with God. So this morning let's consider a few principles of prayer and a few characteristics of prayer. To begin with, prayer is conversation. It's me talking to God, it's you talking to God, and when we, when we converse with God, there's some, some unique things, some wonderful things that happens when we pray. We're blessed with a comprehension of blessings. Notice in Ephesians, 4, excuse me, Ephesians 3, verses 14 through 19. Paul prayed that you may be able to comprehend the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge. When we pray, we begin to comprehend the blessings that God has in store for us, and it motivates us to spend more time with God, and it motivates us to dedicate our lives for His honor and glory. One other benefit of prayer, one of the other characteristics, is there's a suspension of temptation. Notice in Luke 22, when Jesus rose from prayer and went back to the, to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow, and he said, why are you sleeping? Get up, and notice what he says, get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. When we go to God in prayer, we are strengthened. Our eyes are open to what, the, what is right and what is wrong, and he strengthens us in a way that we are aware of what temptation is and gives us the might to, to fight our, uh, the darkness of the night and to stand against the wiles of the devil and to fight off temptation. There's something else. There's a dimension of confidence. In 1 John 5, 14, John said, Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Now that gives me confidence to go in prayer. Now how do I know if what I am asking is in accord with his word and with his will? 
It's because I, I pray, and I do not pray and ask anything that's contrary to biblical principles. And it's, James said you can, uh, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You know, you can pray, doubt, and do without, or you can believe and you can receive. And that's the idea of the verse. There's something else about prayer. It's concentration. Prayer should be focused and it should be intentional. It shouldn't just be just some little prayer that you, that you rattle off. Uh, uh, I had Ira Glickler in my house one time. My children were very young, and I wanted uh, Ira was, was there because he was doing some mission work. And I said, Ira, will you pray for the evening meal? And that rascal said, rub-a-dub-dub, bless this grub. And that wasn't exactly the prayer I was wanting my kids to hear, you know. So, but uh, but we, sh we shouldn't take prayer that casual, you know. It ought to be focused, and Nehemiah is a very good example of that. His prayer was intentional. He expressed his intent to repent and, he, and to augment his life with God's word. This is out of chapter 1, verses 4 through 6. Nehemiah had heard some, that some of his friends had gone back to Jerusalem to investigate it, to see what was going on, to see what condition the city was in. And they brought a report back to Nehemiah, and Nehemiah says, as soon as I heard these words, as soon as I heard how terrible the condition of Jerusalem was, that it was lying in ruins, that there was waste all over, garbage all over. He says, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, and notice how he dresses God. Not just the Lord God of heaven, but notice what he says. And awesome God, who keeps his covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. He, he's, he's focusing on God. He's focusing on the character of God. He's very intentional in saying, God, I know that you'll bless us if we keep your commandments. And he says, God, let your ear be attentive. Let your eyes be open to hear the prayer of your servant that I, may, that I now pray before you day and night. You see, it wasn't something casual. He was praying day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. It was very intentional. It was very focused. God answered his prayer, but you know there are times when God does not answer our prayer in the ways that we think his will. And why is that? Well, think about the word condemnation. Sometimes God says no to our prayers because we're harboring what he hates. In Psalm 66, 18, it says, If I had harbored sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. And then in Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, Indeed, the Lord's hand is not too short to save, and his ear is not too deaf to hear. Listen, but your iniquities have built barriers between you and your God, and your sins have made him hide his face from you so that he does not listen. You know what a barrier is? Drive I-35 through Oklahoma and you'll find out. They got barriers everywhere. I mean, you, I mean, you almost can't drive on the road because they got so many barriers up. And it impedes my speed when I'm trying to get from point A to point B. And it's the same thing with sin. It's barrier after barrier that blocks our communion and our relationship with God. Let me give you another example. When I started coming out here to preach on Sundays, I got rid of my AT&T service. It's because I did not have a connection out here in Roselia with AT&T. I switched to Verizon, and I've got it great. They ought to hire me for a commercial. You know that? <laughs> but there was no power. There was no connection with AT&T. And it's like that's what sin is. It's a, it, it robs us of our connection with God. It's like I think most of you know we were without an air conditioner for almost three weeks. And, uh, uh, the, I mean, we'd had power, we lost our power, and when the power came back on, the air conditioner didn't work. There was a, it had blown up the electricity in the air conditioner to where the power would not get from the, from the receptacle through the fuse box back to the air conditioner to, to, to add con, uh, air conditioning to our, to our house. It just wouldn't work. And that's what, the, that's what sin is. It's a barrier that blocks that flow between us and between God, and it's because we are harboring something that God hates. Now, there's another word that I think of when I'm thinking of prayer, and sometimes God's saying, no, it's the word complication. 
Sometimes God's no is to protect us, not to reject us. Let me tell you a little story. Back in 1876, you, you might remember that, Harold. Uh, that summer in Minnesota, the farmer's crops, I mean, there was just a plague of, of, of grasshoppers that came in and devastated the crops of the farmers. So they, I mean, financially, they were almost ruined. There wasn't the, the, the grain to feed their livestock. It, they, they weren't having food on the table. And so the closer the spring of 1877 the next year drew, the closer it drew near, the more the farmers began to worry about, are we going to have a repeat of last year? They believed their only hope was in divine intervention, so they persuaded their governor, John S. Pillsbury, to set aside April 26 as a day of prayer and fasting. I mean, they closed schools, they shut down businesses, and everybody prayed. Well, as the sun began to rise on the next day on the 27th, the anxious farmers began to go out into the fields to inspect them in hopes that God had answered their prayer. There wouldn't be any grasshoppers. There wouldn't be any grasshopper larvae. Much to their dismay, their crops were just covered with grasshopper, uh, the larvae of the grasshoppers. This went on for three days, and they began to talk among themselves, you know, can we you know, grind this up and use it for feed for the, for the livestock, or should we just destroy it? Lo and behold, I mean, this will shock you. The weatherman's report for that night was way off. You know, I'd like to be a weatherman and be wrong that often and still get paid money. But what happened was that night a cool front moved in and the temperatures dropped so low that it froze all of the larvae and killed them. And they went ahead and were able to grow their crops. You see, the farmers thought God was saying no when they saw the larvae out there and they were de dejected. But they did not realize that God had a plan in place where they would be protected as he arranged an unusual storm front to come in and freeze them to death. Another word I think of is the word confirmation. Sometimes God's no confounds us just before he astounds us. I think you're familiar with, with the story in John 11. You know, the shortest verse in the Bible is John 11:35. Jesus wept. Well, Mary and Martha were two of the closest friends that Jesus had. When he needed a little R&R, &R, he'd, he'd take the little trip over to Bethany from Jerusalem. And I tell people it's just about the distance from Tawanda to El Dorado. And, uh, and he would go over there and get a little R&R. &R. Best friends, you know. And so they send words to Jesus to come very quickly. Our brother is sick unto death. And that used to amaze me when I would read the next verse. It says Jesus tarried. Now, if your best friends are sending you word, come quick, my family member's about to die, most of us would make a beeline to get there as quickly as we could. But it says Jesus tarried. So when Jesus arrives, the sisters come out and they said, Lord, if you would have been here, he maybe wouldn't have died. But our brother Lazarus is dead. And we're told that Jesus wept. But Jesus restored life to Lazarus, and he said to those grieving sisters to clarify things, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live also. But Jesus purposely tarried so Lazarus would die, so we could be taught the lesson of his power over the grave because he restored life to Lazarus. But sometimes we're confounded just before God really does something mighty and miraculous and he astounds us. Psalm 77, 14 says, You're the God who does amazing things. You've revealed your strength among the nations. Think about that. The amazing things that God did, the things that he astounds us with. He provided a ram for Abraham on top of Mount Moriah, and that's why Abraham cried out, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. In 1 Samuel 1, he gave Samuel to Hannah when she was way past childbearing years. And Samuel became a prophet and a priest and a judge for the nation of Israel. In Acts chapter 16, he blessed Paul and Silas with a jailhouse revival. In 1 Kings 17, Elijah prayed and God restored the life of a child. 
all along through here, things looked like everything was going downhill, and people were, were, uh, were, were, were de depressed. They were confounded why God wasn't working, and then he intervened and astounded them in a miraculous way. Another word I think of is the word correlation. Sometimes things aren't just adding up, and God says no because he is emphatic and not erratic. I mean, what if two people in here were praying for the same job? God can't say both, uh, yes to both of us. So the person who gets to know thinks, well, God must not love me. No, it's because God may have something better for you. Or if you're trying to get into a prestigious college and it's not, things aren't falling into place, that's because maybe God has some other place for you that he wants you to be. Sometimes we pray for things that we think are lost, but God's already found them. Let me tell you another story. I think maybe I heard this first time at a missions conference years ago. <clears throat> there was a handyman in a church who was building crates so the church could take the items they had collected for this orphanage over in China. And uh, so he worked feverishly getting these crates ready and getting, them, get all, getting all the supplies in for the orphanage and then crating it up and taking it and be, being shipped out. Well, he gets home a little bit later that night, and he's doing this because he, you know, sometimes I got to do this to see if I'm wearing my glasses, you know, and, and checking his pockets, and he rummages all through his truck and can't find them. He retraces all of his steps through his house, and he can't find them, he, and he just finally just gave up trying to find his glasses. Well, a few months later, the director of the orphanage comes to the United States visiting the churches who had been supporting the orphanage. And he comes to this small church by Chicago. And he gets up and he thanks the people for all their faithfulness over the years. And he said, oh, by the way, before I stop, I want to thank you for the glasses that you sent me. He said the Chinese, uh, the, the, communist, uh, the Chinese Communist Party had just been through our church and they had stomped on everything and had broken everything, including my glasses. And when I saw those glasses in that crate, I picked them up and I put them on. The frames fit perfectly. It was like the prescription was just, just custom made for my glasses. And the handyman was sitting in the back of the church, and he said, I really didn't lose those, did I? You know, God's not erratic. He's emphatic in what he does and the way he works the details of our life together. Another word I think of when I think of prayer is calibration. A no from God is not rejection. It's usually redirection. Think about waiting. You know, waiting is one of the most difficult things that we do. You know, we push, push the 15-second button on the microwave, and we stand there, and we say, man, come on and hurry up. I mean, we're just, we want instant gratification in our lives, but sometimes, like Joseph, God makes us wait for years as he's developing us and setting his plan in place. God's no to one thing is a yes to another. David wanted to build the, ta the temple for God, but God would not allow him to do it. Now, was God, God was saying kind of, no, not to you, because it's got to be a yes to your son. First Chronicles 22, verses 6 through 10. The word of the Lord came to me. This is David speaking. The word of the Lord came to me saying, You have shed much blood and have made great wars. You shall not build a house for my name, because you shed much blood on the earth in my sight. So God said no to him so he could say yes to Solomon, a man of peace. God said no to Paul and redirected him, Acts 16, verses 6 through 10. Paul and his com uh, companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia. Now listen to this. Having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. God would not allow them to go there because he had some other place for them to go. When they came to the border of Mycenae, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to go in. So they passed them by and went down to Troas. And during the night, Paul had a vision of a man from Macedonia standing and begging him, come to Macedonia and help us. So Paul went in that direction and preached the gospel of Christ, and people were saved. Expectation is another word I think of. Sometimes God's no is to, make, is to keep us from being a spectacle and then to do something spectacular. In 1 Kings chapter 19, you know the story about how Elijah had withstood the false prophets of Baal. 
That's a great victory for him. But Jezebel sent him word after that. She said, uh, so let the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow this time. And what she was saying was, just like you made sure those false pro or the prophets of Baal were killed, buddy, your number's up and you're dying before this time tomorrow. So Elijah ran off. He began to sulk and he began to you know, have a pity party and God sent him word and sent him, sent him uh, uh, guided him and directed him you know, and took care of him. And then he cries out and he said, God, he said, just kill me. He said, you know, I am the only faithful person left in, in, in all this country. But God said no to him. He says, I'm not going to take your life, Elijah, because I've got something better for you. Then we flip over to 2 Kings chapter 2. And uh, we're told that, that it happened as they continued, as Elijah and Elisha were speaking, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. God called him up in a miraculous way. Whenever I read that past passage of scripture, I think of Lester Roloff. Lester had children's homes down in Texas and Louisiana and Mississippi. And uh, uh, he got in trouble with the, uh, uh, the attorney general in Texas because they wanted to license uh, Lester's ministries, and, and Lester wouldn't let him do it. He fought him tooth and nail. And so they arrested him and, and, uh, they, uh, in Austin. Uh, and and uh, he comes out of, a, out of the, the offices and the, and the, where they were going to jail, and some of his kids were there from one of his children's home. And old Lester sang out, Ah, children, tell me, do you love Jesus? And they said, Yes, we love Jesus. And he said, Why do you love Jesus? And they started singing out, Because Jesus first loved me. Oh, so it was a tender sight and a tender sound. But I tell you, we, when I say we, I'm talking about churches all over Texas, all over Louisiana, tech churches from Mississippi and Oklahoma and New Mexico, from all around the southern region of the United States, met us. You know, my church in, in, in East Texas, we all met in Austin, and we shut Austin down that day because we, didn't, we thought they were doing old Lester dirty, and he was able to keep his homes open and functioning. And that was all because of the power of prayer. Lester, uh, and the reason this reminds me of him, was Lester was in a plane and, and, and died in a storm. And we always thought about God catching him up in a whirlwind and taking him to glory land himself. He made a wonderful difference in the lives of so many different people. Well, the psalmist says in Psalm 145, the Lord is near to who call on him. Now, what's that mean? That means when we pray to God, we're close to him. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. I'm going to close with this quote from Max Lucado. Our prayers may be awkward. Our attempts may be feeble. But since the power of prayer is in the one who hears it and not in the one who says it, our prayers do make a difference. Well, Father, as we come now, I want to thank you for our time together today. It's my prayer, Father, that we might, even though we do it awkwardly, come to each day of the week, Father, come to you in prayer and seek thy face and seek thy will for our lives. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Well, I'm going to invite you to join me uh, in a song of invita invitation.